जय माधव कुंजाबी हरि जय जय राधा माधव कुंजाबी हरि जय गोपी जनवा गोपी जनवाल गिरीवर नंदन रजन रंजन यशोर नंदन रजन रंजन या मुन चीरा वन या मुन चीरा वन जय राधा माधव कुंजा बिहारी जाए गोपी जन बाल गिरीवर यशोर नंदन ब्रज जनरंजन यशोर नंदन ब्रज जनरंजन यमुना चीरा मन आते कृष्ण आते कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे हरी बो हरी बो हरी बो 
Gora Hari Boy Shila Prabhu Paraki Jai Ananta Koti Vaishnavarinda Ki Jai Shishi Radha Mat Nila Madhava Ki Jai Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman Ki Jai Gaura Premanande All glories to the Assembly Devotees All glories to the Assembly Devotees All glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhaktivedanta Swamin Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nivishesha Shunyavadi Paschatyade Shatarine Mancha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubya Evacha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namo Nama He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namo Sute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I'm very happy to be here uh, in ISKCON Houston. First time I am here, I feel very blessed and uh, feel especially uh, fortunate to share with you some discuss discussion of Rama Leela. I want to say discussion because um, I'm sitting in a room of pundits and it wouldn't be right to make this a unidirectional activity. <laughs> but I do have some thoughts to share and um, let's see where, where, it, where these take us. We'll start with a verse uh, in the beginning of uh, Shugadev Goswami's mm, summary of Rama Lila in the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaivanarottamam 
देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथोजय मुदीर ये नष्ट प्रयेश भद्रेशु नित्यम भागवत भागवत युतम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवती नैष्ठी We're reading from Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 9, Chapter 10, The Pastimes of Lord Ramachandra, Verse Number 3. Please repeat. Tasyanu charitam rajan. Tasyanu charitam rajan. Rishivis tatfadarshivi. ऋषिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फदर्शिस्तत्फद
have all been heard. He, indeed, varnitam, as they have been so nicely described. Buri, many, tvaya, by you, sita pate, of Lord Ramachandra, the husband of Mother Sita. Muhu, more than often. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Translation, O King Parikshit, the transcendental activities of Lord Ramachandra have been described by great saintly persons who have seen the truth. Because you have heard again and again about Lord Ramachandra, the husband of Mother Sita, I shall describe these activities only in brief. Please listen. Purport. Modern Rakshasas posing as educationally advanced merely because they have doctorates. <laughs> have tried to prove that Lord Ramachandra is not the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but an ordinary person. But those who are learned and spiritually advanced will never accept such notions. They will, <clears throat> they will accept the descriptions of Lord Ramachandra and his activities only as presented by tattva darshis, those who know the absolute truth. In Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Personality of Godhead advises tatvidhi pranipatena pariprasnena sevaya upadekshanti te jnanam just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Inquire from him submissively and render service unto him. The self-realized soul can impart knowledge unto you because he has seen the truth. Unquote. Unless one is tattva darshi, in complete knowledge of the absolute truth, one cannot describe the activities of the personality of Godhead. Therefore, although there are many so-called Ramayanas, or histories of Lord Ramachandra's activities, some of them are not actually authoritative. Sometimes Lord Ramachandra's activities are described in terms of one's own imaginations, speculations, or mental sentiments, material sentiments. But the characteristics of Lord Ramachandra should not be handled as something imag imaginary. While describing the history of Lord Ramachandra, Sugadev Goswami told Maharaj Parikshit, you've already heard about the activities of Lord Ramachandra. Apparently, therefore, 5,000 years ago there were many Ramayanas or histories of Lord Ramachandra's activities and there are many still but we must select only those books written by Tattva Darshis Gyaninas Tattva Darshina not the books of so-called scholars who claim knowledge only on the basis of a doctorate this is a warning by Sugadev Goswami. Rishibis Tattva Darshibi, although the Ramayana composed by Valmiki is a huge literature, the same activities are summarized here by Sugadev Goswami in a few verses. Tasyan Ucharitam Rajan Rishibis Tattva Darshibi Shrutam Hi Varnitam Buri Tvaya Sita Pater Mohu O King, of, o King Parikshit, the transcendental activities of Lord Ramachandra have been described by great saintly persons who have seen the truth because you have heard 
again and again about Lord Ramachandra, the husband of Mother Sita, I shall describe these activities only in brief. Please listen. The Bhagavatam as a whole, we can say, is a summary in many respects. And here in the ninth canto, we're getting a sort of fast track preparation for, you can say, the central canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10. And so, Sugadeva Goswami is introducing his topic now by saying, you've already heard what I'm going to tell you, <laughs> and now I will tell you therefore in brief. One of the interesting uh, features, one could say, about the Ramayana is that everyone has already heard it, and yet everyone wants to hear it again. We, we want to hear again knowing perfectly well what, what happens. The, the Ramayana, I say the Ramayana, and yet Srila Prabhupada uh, indicates here from the verse, it seems there have been, and he says there still are, so many Ramayanas. Uh, but we can say sort of generically, the Ramayana uh, is it's telling a story, it is a narrative. Prabhupada is uh, making the strong point, the insistent point, that this is no ordinary narrative, it is telling uh, the story, sometimes he would say history, uh, of none other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And nonetheless, we can appreciate it as story, or we, we might want to turn this around and say, this is the original story. This is the, um, the story of all stories, not as fiction, but as uh, the, the absolute, absolute truth. A few days ago uh, in China, I gave a lecture at uh, the Foreign Studies University in Beijing. Um, my topic was India's favorite story, uh, India's long history of interpretation and adaptation of the Ramayana. And I was advised prior to giving the lecture by the professor, a young lady, very nice, who I've spoken in her class before. Uh, she, she gave a bit of a warning. She said, please be aware that it could be that uh, your class will be monitored. Uh, there could be someone in the class who will be listening that you don't speak about religion. Okay, uh, right. So we're going to tell about Ramachandra and the story of Rama, and we're not going to say a word about religion. So we're not going to say Rama is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <laughs> that was something I decided in advance. Um, but uh, I did discover that it's very possible in China to speak about Dharma. And um, there was no problem with Dharma. And so this made it actually very, very easy. I thought I would share with you uh, something of how I presented uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this talk. I started out by telling about the uh, television series in 1989 of, uh, of Ramanan Sagar, you may be familiar with it, uh, that ran every Sunday for more, more than a year. As it was uh, coming toward completion, as I read, uh, people wrote to uh, the, the director 
in great anxiety that it's coming to an end because everyone knows how how the story goes and they know it's coming to an end now and they were very concerned uh, that um, it's coming to an end can you please extend the story <laughs> and so by popular demand that's what he did which is to say in effect he slowed it down you know every moment becomes a whole leela in itself you know well this has a tradition and I'll I'll get to this later but what I thought to uh, explore broadly, as I did in this talk, is the whole subject of the telling of the Ramayana. Uh, one of the interesting features of the Ramayana, of Valmiki Ramayana, is that the Ramayana is summarized within the Ramayana more than once, especially by Hanuman. Hanuman tells the story more than once. We'll, we'll get to that, but first I think it's nice to remember uh, the impetus for Valmiki to, uh, to write the Ramayana. As you may know the story, he is in the forest and he, he sees, he witnesses something very shocking. Uh, uh, a hunter shoots and kills a croncha bird who is mating at the time that he shoots him. Uh, Valmiki is shocked, and in his shock, from his mouth comes a curse. And the curse goes like this. Manishada pratishtam agama shashvati sama yat kron chamitanarekam avadhi kamamohitam you will find no rest for the long years of eternity, for you killed uh, an unsuspecting bird who was absorbed in mating. And it seems that mm, Lord Brahma was in the mood of a talent scout. He heard this verse and he immediately understand, this is our man. He's a poet. And so he was immediately hired for the job. It's a funny thing about microphone stands. It is. It's it's universal. Yeah, we're in the twenty first century, but they haven't designed a microphone stand that actually works. What to do? Anyway, maybe you can speak better if you don't. <laughs> Without, yeah. Just okay, belt it out. <clears throat> yeah. So this becomes the beginning uh, of of Valmiki's recitation. We can say uh, we understand. Also, he wrote it, and he is recognized as Adi Kavi for this reason. And the Ramayana is Kavya. It is the classical example of Kavya. Uh, and, and then it goes from there. Uh, the, but the writing and the recitation of the Ramayana takes so many different forms, and this is a matter of concern for Srila Prabhupada in his purport. Uh, there are any number of traditions of Ramayana in India and far beyond India. And one thing that struck me from this verse is the, the plural, Rishibi, by Rishis. Uh, it has been um, recited by Rishis, not singular Valmiki, but by so many Rishis. So this is an interesting opening up of possibilities. Well, there is a story, there's a tradition. Uh, some, of the account, some of the accounts of the, of the Ramayana are oral traditions. And in one oral tradition, Hanuman composes his own 
Ramayana. And he composes it on a banana leaf. You know this story. And he, he shows it to Valmiki. And Valmiki is very upset. And Hanuman sees that he's upset. And he doesn't want Valmiki to be upset. So he takes this banana leaf with his beautifully written Ramayana, Ramayana. He crumples it up, puts it in his mouth, and swallows it. What have you done? Well, Hanuman says, it wasn't so important. I just wrote this to remember Rama. But I see it's more important to you that you have composed your Valmiki Ramayana because you are recognized as Valmiki. So it's Valmiki Ramayana. So that's very important for you. So that's OK. For myself, I was just wanting to remember Rama. You can say, in a subtle way, it's ha having a superior purpose in writing. Uh, but that's, that's one, one tradition. Then within the Ramayana, of course, uh, at the end, we have Lava and Kusha, who are reciting the Ramayana to who? To Ramachandra. <laughs> They're telling Rama's story to Rama, and Rama is hearing the story and, and saying, oh, hey, you're talking about me. <laughs> this all happened to me. And so there's this interesting situation going on uh, within the text. Another uh, aspect of this is the, the listening, the hearing of Ram, Ramayana. And it is said that Hanuman is the ideal listener to the, to the Ramayana. That he is always hearing or always reading Ramayana. And it's even said that he uh, was hearing Ramayana as a small child from his mother. Wait a minute, he hadn't met Rama yet. It all hadn't happened yet. Well, yes, it had happened. How many times in the past the Rama Lila is going on? And so it's an eternal story which is simply continuing, and Hanuman is hearing it. The Ramayana does take uh, what may be called transcreation forms in later times, uh, which become very popular uh, in India today. People in North India very much appreciate uh, Tulsi Das's Ram Charit Manas, which he wrote not in Sanskrit but in uh, Avadi. Uh, dialect of Hindi. And it's generally this Ramayana which is known in North India when people uh, speak or speak of Ramayana. This is what they're familiar with for the most part. Uh, but prior to the uh, Ram Charit Manas in South India, in Tamil Nadu, was composed, I think, in the 12th century. Uh, the Kam, what came to be known the Kamba Ramayana of Kamban. And I don't read Tamil. Uh, I've read, you know, some a translation of, of parts of it. But uh, it strikes me that such a work is an elaboration on Valmiki Ramayana and one may be safe to say we're, we're speaking of these rishibi, of the sages in this case. In the case of the Ram Charit Manas, as I understand, someone may uh, be able to correct me here, Srila Prabhupada at one time spoke not so positively about it. And I was concerned, and then um, at one point I met uh, with uh, Radha Govinda Goswami, who I would say probably knows the Ram Charit Manas more than anyone, uh, probably more than anyone on the planet. 
<laughs> he knows it very well. And I asked him, is there a problem with the Ram Charitmanas? He said, problem? Problem? How could there be a problem with Ram Charitmanas? <laughs> Some impersonalism? No, no impersonalism. So I felt reassured uh, by him in that regard. Uh, in any case, uh, going back to the Ram Charit, Ram, uh, Ram Charit, sorry, going back to the Kamba, Kamba Ramayana, it is said um, by, dare we say, these scholars with their PhDs, uh, that one can notice a kind of development over time that the later Ramayanas are um, more devotional. They bring in more bhakti. They elaborate on how Rama is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whereas in uh, the Valmiki Ramayana, it is, m m for the most part, not at all indicated. It's especially indicated in uh, the first kanda and the last kanda, but the uh, second through six, uh, Rama is celebrated as the perfect man. Uh, this brings us back to the point uh, which uh, Bridge Basi Prabhu was making yesterday at the end of his lecture uh, that we have the personality of Godhead in the mood of a human being. And it makes for this interesting, we can say, tension that he is the supreme. We understand in terms of tattva, uh, from the tattva darshis, that he is the supreme personality of Godhead. And he is in the mood of a human being. And in the mood of a human being, the idea of being the Supreme Personality of Godhead can be a disturbance. Uh, one interesting sort of interlude uh, in the Kamba Ramayana in this regard, I find, is that in one of the, you can say, most difficult passages of the Ramayana in terms of uh, moral ambiguity is that after Sita returns from Lanka and Lord Rama is completely cold to her and says, you can go your way. I don't want to have anything more to do with you because in effect he's saying, you have been with another man. And so then the Agni Pariksha is arranged. We all know this story. In the, in the Kamba Ramayana, Kamban describes that at one point, Dasharata, who has already departed for Svarga long before this, years before this, out of heartbreak, reappears, he descends from Svarga in order to remind Rama who he is. <laughs> now, is that authorized? Is that not authorized? I like to think it is part of the expanded, un, uh, the unlimited pastimes of Rama being described by the sages. In any case, we may take it that way or we, we may not, but that tradition is also there. People uh, relate to that, and that helps to appreciate that Rama is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Another uh, sort of detail, but case of elaboration we see in the Kamba Ramayana, in the Valmiki Ramayana, uh, the description moving much back uh, earlier in the text to um, Dasharat's going to Mithila. Valmiki Ramayana, he gives two verses to describe his travel. Uh, Kamban gives 300 verses to describe his 
transit from Ayodhya to uh, Mithila. He elaborates, and it's very poetic and it's very relishable. Uh, Rupa Goswami says that um, for the purpose of rasa, uh, one can draw from uh, the the standard text to to write a drama if one. Uh, if one establishes the correct rasa, then it is appropriate to elaborate, to make some adjustment in one's description. So it seems that Kamban is doing that. Tulsi Das uh, was late 15th century with his Ram Charit Manas, and one of his what shall we call it? Is it an innovation or is it a revelation uh, from Chaitanya Charitamrita referring to the same, uh, not in terms of Tulsidas, but I think it's Kurma Purana, uh, the idea that uh, the Sita who was abducted by Ravana was not the actual Sita, but a Maya Sita. This we don't find in Valmiki, we do find it in Tulsi, Tulsi Das. So in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, we understand the devotees become greatly relieved by hearing this, isn't it? So this seems also to be an, an appropriate elaboration, something which is otherwise uh, hidden. Well, in this talk uh, that I, I gave in Beijing, uh, I also spoke about performance of the Ramayana. Uh, some of you know this is performed every year uh, in India in so many places, but the most famous in North India is in Ramnagar, just opposite of uh, Varanasi. And uh, this performance goes on for more than a month every day uh, five to 12 hours per day, rain or shine, mud or dry ground, um, in different parts of the town. The, 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 the Ramayana travels. So it happens that uh, when Lord Rama is, is, has been banished from Ayodhya when he's been informed you must leave Ayodhya. He accepts and he leaves and he goes to the forest and he literally goes and everyone in the audience uh, who are watching this, they follow as the, not audience anymore, but now they are the residents of Ayodhya. And so the distinction between audience and performer gets blurred. And also the distinction between, you know, the, 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 the stage and the rest of the world gets completely blurred so that everything mixes and uh, and, and shifts in this way. And in this way, everyone has this experience, even though everyone already knows what happens, of the Leela happening now, happening again. And they experience the performers as Sita and Rama and so on. So it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Performance is not just you know, a show and not just an act. It's, it's uh, for the participants, it's the real thing. Well, there are these, uh, I also spoke about the moral ambiguities, the two famous ones, the one which I mentioned uh, of uh, Rama's reception of Sita the other, of course, is Ram, Rama's killing of Bali, uh, which several uh, commentators have, have said that, uh, several modern commentators have said that Rama's justification for himself to be in hiding when he shoots an arrow at Bali are weaker 
than the arguments from Bali. As you know, probably there's a, a, a dialogue that goes on as Bali is dying. He says, why have you done this? Why have you done this? This is not Kshatriya Dharma. And, and Ramachandra says, you're just a monkey. <laughs> and he gives a couple of other arguments. But people say, these are not very you know, convincing arguments, really. Well, there's an interesting, it seems that Kamb Kamban felt the same, that his arguments were maybe not sufficient. And so Kamban added one additional argument, at least, uh, which is interesting, I find. And that is uh, the following, that Lakshman defends Rama's behavior uh, in the following way. He says to Bali that uh, if you had known, if you had seen Rama, then you, you would have automatically felt impelled to take shelter of him. And this would have been a problem for Rama because Rama gives shelter to whoever asks him for shelter. To whoever approaches, he gives shelter. And if he had given shelter to you, this would spoil everything. Because he had made this agreement with Sugriva and so on and so forth. So he had to hide himself. <laughs> so how to take that? In any case, uh, this tradition is there. Also from Kamban Ramayana, because um, a contrast is made be between uh, his style, his writing style, and that of Valmiki, I think it's interesting to appreciate something of the something of the poetry of Kamban. This is a translation of one verse, uh, which is spoken by Ravana. This is during the war in Lanka and during, during a pause in the war, uh, Ravana is speaking to his grandfather and he says the following, he says, Rama's shafts, his arrows, are like words on the tongue of a great poet. They weave themselves into feet and meter. Feet, of course, has this double meaning, pada. Feet and meter, appropriate ornaments and all, and take on the eternal quality of music that never dies. So he's praising the arrows of Rama as being like poetry. <laughs> so nice, you know. And this is Ravana, right? <laughs> Ravana, who's going to be killed uh, by... Uh, by a, a shaft, one of the shafts. Uh, so like this, I elaborated uh, some other references to uh, interpretations of Ramayana. And I ended this because I was in Beijing, in China. Uh, so I reminded them of a character in Chinese literature which whom they are very familiar with, namely uh, Sun Wu Kong. Sun Wu Kong, uh, who is uh, a monkey who joins uh, with others in their travels to the West. This is a famous uh, story called The Journey to the West, or the Xi Yu Ji. And some have suggested that uh, the, um, so many things f about Sun Wukong seem to have been taken from Hanuman. Uh, it seems that historically, yes, it's possible some features were taken. There's one particular episode. We all know Hanuman uh, as a child. He uh, jumps to reach the sun to take the sun as, um, as, as a piece of fruit. And Sun 
Wukong uh, is also known for having taken peaches uh, from a celestial garden and he gets punished for that uh, much as Hanuman is pub punished uh, for trying to reach the sun so there are but there but there is a tra tradition of this monkey hero that goes back um, very long in China so one can't necessarily say it all comes from Hanuman unless you take it that the story of Hanuman, the Ramayana, is eternal. It has been going on um, in so many cycles and therefore it could have been drawn in that way. Uh, so in this way, I, I gave uh, a few ideas about uh, the Ramayana. I also spoke about Dharma. Uh, and as I said, I found that this was safe <laughs> to speak about uh, uh, dharma and adharma uh, and and so with such discussions uh, that I presentations that I give in China you could say my one of my main objectives is to be invited back uh, in these universities so uh, this was uh, in this case a success but the the question may remain for us what is the use of hearing Ram Leela if we don't know that this is uh, about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. To which I would only say, in this case, these people uh, were listening, they were hearing the name Rama, they were, I mean, very much, I, I got them involved in the story, uh, and so my sense is that benefit is also there. Um, and and it, it reminded me that the Ram story is still in the process of expanding. It's expanding in the hearts of the devotees each time that we hear Ram Leela, each time uh, that we speak Ram Leela, uh, the, the story of Rama this favorite story I said of India, it's becoming a favorite story way beyond India as it has for centuries. And uh, this is a very wonderful thing. Uh, going back to Srila Prabhupada's warning, he's saying that we should hear from Tattva Darshis uh, uh, because the, the essential point is this. We're appreciating that uh, we are dealing with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yes, he is in the mood of, of a man, of a human being, uh, but because we understand that he is not an ordinary human being, he's not even an extraordinary human being, he is the Supreme Being who is playing as a human, then we get the full benefit of uh, hearing his pastimes. Now, as I was um, as I was coming here to the Houston Temple, being brought um, by Advaita Chandra Prabhu, he made a request to me. He said, "You'll be speaking on uh, this morning," and that's. We, we like that you'll speak on Ram Leela, but he said, I have two more requests, two more subjects which I would humbly request you to speak about. Uh, and uh, the first of these, he said he wanted me to speak something about uh, the practice of sadhana bhakti, because he said here in Houston, we want to encourage the devotees to practice sadhana bhakti. So uh, I will say something very briefly on this subject. And then he asked me to also speak something about my relation, my experience uh, with the late His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami. Uh, because um, we, we had uh, many exchanges and devotees here are not aware of those. So, briefly, um, 
sadhana. I think what I want to say about sadhana is an, an analogy that I like to give, uh, which has to do with flying, flying airplanes or riding in airplanes. Um, I fly a fair amount into different parts of the world, and so I'm going to airports, and I go through the process of checking in and going through security and waiting and then getting on the airplane. And then uh, when everyone's on the airplane, then the announcements come and then they taxi out to the, to the uh, runway and then we take off. Uh, a couple of times it's happened that uh, we have been accelerating down the runway and then suddenly the uh, the pilot puts on the brakes and stops and turns around for they'll, they'll always say you know some technical difficulty <laughs> actually in one case they gave us more detail but um, the point is that in spiritual life we are so to speak, we want to take off. We are engaged in sadhana in order to realize sadhya, and by sadhya to reach siddha, to reach perfection. And, and so the sadhana process is really that. It's a, it's, a, it's a process of accelerating our attraction for, uh, for the Lord such that the Lord will help us, in this analogy, get off the ground. Uh, as we know with an airplane, as it reaches a certain speed, by the design of the airplane, the, the air will simply lift it off. Uh, by, the, by the, whatever it's called, the air stream. Um, yeah. The, it will lift off because of the shape of the wings uh, when the speed is, is enough and by its design and so on. So we're, we are, as we are engaged in devotional practice, uh, the practice is not that we just want to, you know, go a few steps down the runway and then turn around and go back and then go a few steps down the runway again and then turn around and go back and do this for the rest of our lives. Um, yes, I've been practicing Krishna consciousness for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and yes, I keep going on the runway. <laughs> no, we want to get off, isn't it? We want to take off. We want to go back home, back to Godhead, which is uh, beyond this world. And so it takes this regular effort, but it's an effort that we want to accelerate. We want to uh, build on our practice. And as we build, we get momentum. And as we get momentum, then at some point, Krishna, the, the Krishna's mercy factor will come in. <laughs> and then we are lifting off. That is wanted. Uh, and therefore, um, we are urged by our acharyas. Rupa Goswami, uh, in particular, gives us so many details for how to practice sadhana. Uh, it is a process, but we want to remember what is the aim. And if we remember the aim, then we will make uh, the determined effort to, uh, to do the process. Well, that's what I wanted to say on that subject. And then just briefly uh, speaking about His Holiness Tamal Krishna Maharaj. I first, I didn't first meet him, but I first um, got speaking with him in Vrindavan in 1988 uh, when he was giving a course at the uh, uh, VIHE. And at that time, he invited me to China. And 
I thought this could be interesting. And so the next year, opportunity came. I, I visited Hong Kong and then uh, Guangzhou. And I met Goswami Maharaj in Guangzhou and also Giridhari Maharaj. We flew to Xi'an uh, and met some people there. And then we were scheduled to fly to another city, Wuhan. But uh, something happened. We were stuck in the airport in uh, Xi'an uh, because of fog. Um, has anyone traveled with Tamal Krishna Goswami? Yes? Yeah, you have experience traveling with him? Those of you who have traveled with Goswami Maharaj, you may know if anything goes awry, <laughs> it can be quite an intense experience. <laughs> well, this was an intense experience, but the situation was such that there was really nothing we could do about it. The situation was that it was the middle of winter, so it was freezing cold. We had to stay in the airport because we'd already given up our hotel. And uh, they were saying, you know, just wait here because the fog may lift and we could leave. Um, we couldn't really uh, stay outside of the airport because it was freezing cold, nor could we really survive in the airport because in those days, it seemed like everyone in China was a chain smoker. It was horrible. I still have this image in my mind of one man who was simultaneously, simultaneously smoking a cigarette and eating an orange. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> all we could do was sit there and go Swami Maharaj was just shaking his head. You know. <laughs> anyway, um, it, was, it was several years before I would go back to China, but uh, this opportunity came to, uh, to teach in Hong Kong at Chinese University of Hong Kong. And when the opportunity was first brought to, to me, I was invited, you could come and, and, um, and teach in the university as a regular uh, instructor. Initially I said, Hong Kong, are you kidding? Why Hong Kong? And then the devotee who was inviting me said, this is such an opportunity Tamal Krishna Goswami would certainly be pleased by this if you would come. And that was enough for me. I just immediately said, yes, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. Prior to that, uh, backing up, um, I, I, it was in Gainesville, Florida. I happened uh, to, meet Tamal, to meet Tamal Krishna Maharaj. Uh, I think he was there for a GBC meeting and I was just passing through. And at the time, this was 1994, um, possibly 95, I was um, in considering to go back to university. And I was being very much encouraged to do so by His Holiness Ridayananda Goswami. But I wasn't really sure yet, should I or should I not? So I, I presented the whole uh, idea to Tamal Krishna Goswami and after I explained everything to him he said with total conviction he said yes you should do it and that response from him in total conviction completely changed from for me what before was all indecisiveness he said yes you should do it Okay, <laughs> and then I did. Later I realized more why he was so strongly saying that. And that was because he was thinking of doing the same. <laughs> and he wanted company. And so, so after some, some 
m months, I was enrolled. I was at University of California in Santa Barbara. Goswami Maharaj had enrolled uh, in Dallas at uh, SMU. And he called me on the phone and said, so, <laughs> I'm here, you're there, we're both in the university, what are we doing? And so over the next weeks and months, he would regularly, we would regularly communicate uh, by phone, sort of comparing notes, what are we doing in the university, what is our experience? And then this continued when I went to Oxford and he went to Cambridge. That's kind of a, another story, why it, why it is that he ended up going to Cambridge. Anyway, I was in Oxford, he went to Cambridge, uh, which are about three hours apart drive. And so, Goswami Maharaj invited me to come on weekends, like once a month, to just come and stay with him. And there we would share our experiences and Goswami Maharaj, as you know, would be very systematic. So when I would come to stay with him, he would get out a pad of paper and say, okay, so what's a topic you want to discuss? <laughs> and then I would say something and he would write it down. So I have the following topic, and then he would say, and then he would write that down. And then he would say, so what's, your, what's another topic? He would write it. So like that, we'd get a list of topics for the weekend to discuss. Uh, and it was wonderful. We, we had wonderful discussions. Uh, a, a major theme of these discussions was, what are we going to do when we're finished with our studies? And this, of course, uh, was, was part of the um, terrible pain of his sudden departure that we could never know uh, what Goswami Maharaj would do. Uh, but one other incident I wanted to share. I was in Oxford, he was in Cambridge. He phoned me one day and he said, um, he said, you know, I was, uh, studying Sanskrit as, at SMU. Here in Cambridge, I'm not studying Sanskrit. I'm working on my dissertation. There's, um, Sanskrit is not an essential aspect of what I'm doing, so, but I spent all this time at SMU learning Sanskrit. I don't want to lo lose what I learned. So how should I keep it up? He wanted me to adv give advice, how he should keep up his Sanskrit. So I started saying, well, you know, you could, you could uh, make a kind of quota every day. You can just uh, read X number of verses of Bhagavad Gita every day and analyze the grammar of those verses. Or maybe you could do something with Brahma Samhita because you were Compose. you were putting together this book on the Brahma Samhita. So like that, I was giving ideas and he was saying, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not going to work. And then finally he said, you know, the only way this is going to work, the only way that I'm going to really keep up the Sanskrit every day as if there's money on it. <laughs> Maharaj, what do you mean money on it? He said, okay, here's my, suggest here's my proposal. He said, you're doing Sanskrit work, yes. Um, I was anyway working with, uh, I was doing some translation of Hari Bhakti Vilasa. And he said, okay, you're doing that. I'll work on, on something Let's make a deal. Every day, we're going to spend minimum 45 minutes a day on our Sanskrit. And if either of us somehow miss a day, we will, we will by obligation, we will report 
to the other that we have missed a day. And when we have missed a day, we will owe the other person some money. <laughs> and then the question was, how much money? <laughs> and I was saying, well, you know, it could be one pound. And he said, one pound, come on, that's nothing. <laughs> So, <clears throat> so it was settled, it would be five pounds. <laughs> and then he said, let's make it five days a week. Not seven, okay? Five days a week, right? And it can be any five days, okay? <laughs> he started making, you know, little conditions like this. <laughs> And then finally, when we had it all worked out, he said, and you can be sure that I am never going to have to pay you five pounds. <laughs> so that was the deal we made. We kept it up for about a year, and then we both got distracted with other things. We'd probably be owing each other so much money if we <laughs> kept it up. But that was, that was uh, sweet interactions with Goswami Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So I'll stop there um, and invite if there's any comment or discussion on Ram Leela, on telling of uh, this, the this favorite story uh, of Lord Rama. Um, anything about the controversial activities of Lord Rama or some other point? We have a few minutes since we're fasting this morning. Yes, about Lord Ram as the Supreme Lord. Mm. I can't remember Prabhupada in the uh, teachings of Lord Chaitanya, um, was in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he says that even if you see, even if you see Lord Chaitanya as a great personality and mm. speaking about him as a great personality, mm. uh, you'll be greatly benefited, the, the reader will be greatly benefited. Oh, okay, yeah. that's so. encouraging, yes. Yeah. So it's bona fide. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, go, Paul. You mentioned that Maharaj was thinking of going to school himself, uh, to university himself, and so why was he thinking of going to university himself? Uh, he wanted to. Well, it, it was it was connected at least partially to his uh, preaching in China. He understood that it would be beneficial to have academic qualification to uh, be able to speak in you know educated circles in China, uh, and so I think that was a large part of the motivation. And I think also he wanted to, well, the, 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 the general point Prabhupada was uh, so many times saying, you know, we should be preaching to the educated people uh, to, uh, yeah. And so I think he wanted to expand his own field of preaching also outside of China. Certainly his motivation was in always in all cases or in all respects, um, serving Srila Prabhupada and um, preaching the mission, the mission of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, at the same time, he found the intellectual, so many aspects of the intellectual culture um, very challenging. And this was the subject of much of our, much of our discussion uh, that we would have over the over the during the months and and years to uh, it was about two year period I guess we we would talk uh, fairly frequently on these things.
Um, and I think he also, because Srila Prabhupada had said, start a university in Mayapur. In fact, this was the point when Goswami Maharaj suddenly became very <laughs> sharp and insistent that I should go back to university because I'd mentioned to him that while I was spending time in Mayapur, devotees there were suggesting that um, I could be involved in development of a university in Mayapur. And I was asking the devotees in Mayapur, but I have no academic qualification. What can I do? And they were saying, well, we will just get, um, we, we'll bring retired um, university Indian retired university professors, we will engage them. And that made Goswami Maharaj very angry. He said, they're just, he slammed his table, <laughs> his, his fist on the table and said, they're still thinking like hippies. <laughs> and that in the same breath he said, you should go back to school, get qualified. And um, so that's, I think, a, uh, but China in particular, and this has been my experience, uh, that it's very much open doors in China for me that I can speak in these universities because the qualification is so-called, <laughs> in the purport, Prabhupada says, uh, and posing as ed educationally advanced merely because they have doctorates. Anyway, it gets us through the door, you know, to 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 speak in so many so many venues. So. <laughs> yes, yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh. That uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did prove that Sita Devi is a Maya, one who kidnapped by Ravana because he was bringing that uh, from the. Yeah. Yes, I think it was was it Kurma Purana. Yeah. Kurma. Yeah. Yes, so that was a confirmation, and we can say that therefore our acharyas um, acknowledge that understanding. Hari Parshan. Oh, I think Hari Parshan. Yeah. Hari Krishna, thank you, Maharaj, so much for the wonderful class. Because you spoke one realization from Kamba Ramayan about uh -huh. Lord Ram not shooting in front of Bali. It reminded me of another incident which happened before Lord Ram met Sugriv. And uh, uh, when he arrived on this Parvat, Rishamukh Parvat, at that time Hanuman was sent to um, inspect as to who these individuals are. So when Hanuman first met Lord Ram and Lakshman, Hanuman first greeted them. He was disguised as a Brahmana. Yeah. He greeted them and he asked them who they are. And as soon as he came to know that these are actually the Lord of my life, he rendered service unto them and brought them to uh, Sugriva. So one of the commentators there say, Hanuman follows the exact procedure. Tadvidhi pranipatena, first pranam, uh -huh. <laughs> pari prashna. <laughs> and then Sevaya. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so Hanuman nice. here is displaying the exact sequence yeah. that has to Which be followed. Which Prabhupada is referring to in this purport. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing, because uh, the topic of Tulsi Das was brought out, and uh, about impersonalism being in the Ram Charit Manas. Mm. So, few years ago, I had asked some of my god brothers about the so called impersonal quotes in the Ram Charit Manas. So, as far as I know, honestly, there are some quotes which could be, which could be construed as Vaishnav or as, I mean, impersonal. Hmm. Also, I, also in Bhagavatam. Yeah, <laughs> but I want to, I want to say this thing that, uh, in uh, the Tattva Sandarbha of Srila Jiva Goswami, is the commentary of Srila Baldev Vidya Bhushan, where Srila Baldev Vidya Bhushan clearly says. In Sridhar Swami's commentary, Kvachin Kvachin Mayavad Ullekha Drishyate, 
that definitely there is trace of mayavad in sridhar swami's commentary but he says that is according to badisha mishnyay badisha mishnyay means in order to attract a fish or an impure substance an impure substance is put on the hook <laughs> so badish or fish is attracted by amish or an impure <laughs> substance so in order to attract an impure substance another impure substance is put on the hook <laughs> similarly in order to attract a mayavadi shridhar swami has inserted some mayavadi ideas into his commentary on the shrimad bhagavatam acha <laughs> <laughs> so i take tulsi das's some of tulsi das's uh, verses uh-huh. which could be interpreted both ways to mean that he has actually written them according to badisha mishnya uh-huh. which shridhar swami also did so just as we don't reject shridhar swami because yeah, yeah. of writing mayavad mm-hmm. similarly yeah. i don't think that a devotee poet is to be looked upon with the uh-huh. same vision thank you that's mm-hmm. that's reassuring mata <laughs> ji <laughs> Thank you very much Maharaj. It's nice to meet you after so many years of meeting your dear disciples who revere you with all their hearts. Maharaj, I've had a little pricking question for many years. Um and that is why did Sita Devi ignore her husband's wish? and enter the earth anyway uh he he begged her please don't go but she ignored him yeah so can you give a little explanation <laughs> sorry for the tough question <laughs> i suppose there are uh many ways of of answering this um but let me give a literary answer i i've mentioned that the ramayana is a story it doesn't have to mean that it's you know as prabhupad would say mythology but it's a story uh it's a narrative uh which attracts us and draws us and and as a story it has as uh it has a rasa it has a primary rasa according to uh acharya's um what's his name rupan son of but before in any case anandavardhana yes anandavardhana the what 12th century uh person has has said that the dominant rasa of the ramayana because it's kavya is karana um which can be understood as um as pathos in greek it's a sad story <laughs> if sita would go back to rama that would spoil the rasa incidentally i i don't remember I think it was a lecture maybe it was a conversation I think it was a lecture Shiva Prabhupada is speaking about Ram Leela and he says the main lesson I think he said main lesson of the of Ramayana is that it is very difficult to maintain a wife <laughs> <laughs> Anyway Hari Krishna he Prabhupada said so so Lord Rama you know playing as a human is torn between two kinds of duty and he decides that he needs to uh prioritize the duty of being the the spotless character the king of spotless character where there is no issue about his wife and therefore he sends her to the forest and when he later 
realizes the folly of that, the un, that it's not necessary, he goes, begs her to return. By that time, by that time, it's too late. Um, a lot of feminist commentators have kind of taken this up in a very strong way and said, uh, "This is the Sita we're looking for." <laughs> that she finally affirm, you know, asserts herself. And I think, actually, there's something to it. And I like this because it shows the multiplicity of the Lord's pastimes. There's something for everyone, including the, the you know, the feminists. Yeah, there's something for everyone. Yeah, yes. So, so if I can just add a little bit to that. Um, uh, in... Um, in the fifth canto where there's prayers of Hanuman to Lord Ramachandra, a little a bit of the Ramayana in the Jambudvipa area, there's uh, Prabhupada in one purport, he talks about how the Ramayana teaches to the average person that it's impossible to be happy in the material world, mm -hmm. along the lines of what you said. And, and, the, and the ninth canto says that quite directly in the verses. Mm, yeah. uh, and then, uh, but for the, from the Lord's perspective, the Ramayana allows him to taste this viraha bhav, this, yeah. this mood and separation. Mm. And so for both lessons, for the public and also for his own enjoyment, a final union between Ram and Sita would essentially negate or destroy that, that mood which he came to relish, yeah. which from our perspective is painful, but from his perspective is, uh, is, is really relishable. Yeah. And of course they reunite in the spiritual world. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I should mention that Radhika Raman Prabhu has written a very nice article, isn't it, on uh, the Bhagavatam's representation of Ram Lila. It was a, a seminar, not an, not oh. an article. Okay. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh.